uh, the, re the real true bluers are here today. Barry, Quentin, uh, Abbas, uh, Aisha. Anyway, uh, I, I understand that it's the end of the term and it's a beautiful day and no problem with that. Um, but since we do have, I have a lot of things to, to show you and talk about, I'm gonna go right into it. And by the way, this will be like every other workshop on YouTube, so you can always uh, see it if you've missed it. Um, so today is a uh, point of view after doing short docs and personal docs, I am doing point of view docs. Um, do, do journalists make um, good uh, documentary filmmakers? Actually, um, you know, for any journalist who's sort of frustrated with the uh, impossibility of, of actually, you know, having his own view of things come through. I mean, the, 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 this is the, the golden rule of mainstream media, right? Objectivity and point of view is about having a subjective, it's about having a, a, your own personal tack on things, right? Um, and, and it is, you know, one of the, the better reasons to do documentary because you do not have to pretend to be objective. Um, parenthesis here, I don't really believe that there is such, such thing as pure objectivity. Of course, mainstream media has to propose both sides. And I'm, I'm, we're going to start today with um, something. I'm just going to show you a, a minute or two of a film that was uh, shown on documentary channels, which is a subsidiary of CBC. CBC got uh, a lot of flack for it. It's um, the film is called Sled Dogs. It's about mushing. It's about the, the races with sled dogs. And of course, it had a very strong point of view. And um, the, the, you know, the, the senior directors, uh, the, the ombudsman had to weigh in and say, hold on, um, this is not, you know, CBC itself. This is a point of view. This is, uh, this is the filmmakers um, tack on things. You know, they, the, 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 what the ombudsman, the CBC ombudsman wrote says, think of it as similar to the, uh, an individual perspective that a columnist writes in a newspaper. So uh, let, I'll show you, I'm gonna share my screen. I'll just show you a little bit of that uh, to set the table. It's long, so I'm not going to show it all. Brossez vos dents en moins de 10 secondes avec cette brosse à dents révolutionnaire. Elle a été inventée par un dentiste. Of... <clears throat> the dog sledding companies have done a very good job of convincing the tourists that these dogs live great lives, that they love what they do, they love pulling the sleds, and that these dogs aren't like regular dogs. They're super athletes. The biggest thing that I think we need to educate the public on is that there are sled dogs and there are dogs. The tourists, the traveling public, have no idea what is going on in these outdoor warehouses where they are keeping these dogs. I thought I could come back here and it would be okay. It's just, it was just all so wrong. Canadian authorities are investigating a Whistler sled dog operation for allegedly slaughtering up to 100 dogs after the 2010 Winter Olympics. Sled dog companies are, are businesses. They're there to make a, a profit. They're not there for the welfare of the dogs. They used to put two or three dogs inside of these things. A hundred dogs being killed at Whistler is a horrible thing. But that's just the tip of the iceberg. The end of the season was when things started to become more real to me. It looks like a concentration camp when you come and visit it. All the dogs that couldn't run, they used to be shot. I approached the police. There was just zero response. That whole town up there runs as a good old boy network. I will remind everybody that I'm not doing anything illegal. The teaching was charged for animal cruelty on eight counts. What we called for was a complete ban. And the government just wasn't going to go there. The government supported business. There was money to be made. When they're tethered, they may be living amongst other dogs. That's not a community, it's a prison. Every single day, things are changing. Things are getting better for the dogs. If it wasn't humane, we wouldn't do it. The world is watching on 44. Five, four, three, two, one, go! 
those dogs that win the Iditarod are the dogs that will win the Super Bowl. It's kind of like somebody running a marathon, and now somebody asks you to run 10 in a row. That's what these guys are doing. I just want to see if I can do it personally. They do it for the fame. They do it for the money. There's a prize for it. Most of those people only see the start and the finish. They don't even see the thousand miles in between. Yeah. This industry is an abomination. The dogs that are kept out on these, these short chains for the vast majority of their lives is all happening out of sight, out of mind. Can there be a sled dog industry that is fair to the sled dog? That's the million dollar question. Okay, I'm going to stop it there because I think you get the point. Um, so, um, um, so um, this is a, a fairly typical um, uh, point of view documentary. That is, it's a social issue, but there is a strong, you know, there's a, a strong point of view here, and it's that this is not a good thing to do. Now, the CBC got into a lot of trouble because there is always a, another side to the story. You can see that there's a bit of that in the, in the film, but obviously that's, you know, it's not supposed, this is not, you know, a, tr a tribunal where you have, you know, the two, two sides being weighed carefully. It's obviously, uh, the, you know, a point of view documentary is someone tapping you on the shoulder and saying, I want you to think about this thing and I want you to think about it in this way. Um, where the I think the CBC got into trouble is that apparently, uh, and this is why point of view documentaries can be often uh, problematic for the broadcasters, is because the, the the filmmaker had approached, of course, a lot of dog trainers and and uh, to have access, and then they they claim that they she misrepresented what she was going to do and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So. Point of view, uh, you know, the, the, the CBC can wash its hands of the whole thing by saying, this is not our take, this is the, the filmmaker's take, uh, and it's a legitimate question to raise, um, sort of thing. Um, uh, but um, <clears throat> I, what the kind of stuff, the kind of point of view documentaries that I would like to show you um, is less, a little less mainstream, less. Um, you know, taking a tack on something that definitely has two sides, um, something that is more, shall we say, less attackable um, and more uh, more creative, because this is very much more on the, the mainstream kind of newsy kind of uh, filmmaking, what you just saw. Um, a better example of what I'm talking about is this. Oh, wait a minute. For some reason. I found. Terry Jones. What we're about today is 9-11. What we want to do today is bring attention to what happened, of course, almost 10 years ago. It was a radical Islamic attack 
that day. And we must, as Americans, we must send a very clear message to the Muslim community. Islam talks, generosity, uh, goodness, but, but, but is Islam actually a generous religion? It's a religion of bondage. It's a religion of lies and deception. It is a religion that promotes violence. That, that is the true nature of Islam. No, it's not. Women in Islam it's are still really being not. stolen. These, that's the cat that wanted to burn this, uh, the Quran. It's from Florida. I know you heard about him. He said, no, hey. How you going to run around talking about you preaching God and all of that? And you tell you want to burn a holy book of God. Of the radical element of Islam. We must look around the world and see what is being done. Nothing you can make that can't be made. No one you can save that can't be saved. It's easy. All you need is love. Do, 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 do. All you need is love. Do, 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 do. All you need is love. Love. Love is all you need. All you need is love. It's a free country, folks. Let me hear you say. So, um, I mean, it's the same idea, right? In this case, we're not uh, denou exposing the mistreatment of dogs. We're exposing Islamophobia, um, uh, but it is done uh, with a, a lot more, shall we say, grace, and it's le uh, and also with more uh, narrative to it. There is a real story to it. In the first story, in the first uh, the sled dogs, it's it's essentially like you do in a in the news. You pile up evidence and pile up evidence and pile up evidence, and then you know until it it really becomes quite a snowball and it becomes unsurmountable. Um, in this case, there's you know there's a real story, a, a, a real you know there's the public square. Nothing's being said. You see that this guy is taking up a soapbox. He's a well known. Islamophobe uh, in the United States, by the way, uh, he, and um, he starts spewing his stuff and slowly but surely the tide changes. Now, I, I suppose one could uh, ask if the guy who is singing All You Need Is Love was actually planted there. Um, I, I, I wondered about that, but even if he had been planted there by the filmmaker, for me that doesn't take away from the strength of, of, of what they're doing, showing that ideas can be overturned. It's a question of, 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 of numbers and it's a question of, of feeling, right? And so it's a very, very simple thing, um, but that, that you know, really packs a punch. Um, uh, so do you have any questions? Sorry, so, sorry. I came late, so. Yeah. Hi. Could you Hi, give Anna. a little bit of a context? What did we just watch? What? Can you give me a little bit of the context? What did we just watch? Oh, we what we watch is called the Public Square, and it's a three minute. It's a short documentary, three minute long, but it tells it's it's essentially how um, by using simply the idea of the Public Square, Times Square. Where people go and there's all kind, you know, people expound all kinds of ideas about all kinds of things, and sometimes the, they make sense and sometimes they don't. This is 
this is a, a guy that's made quite a reputation for himself, Terry, I forget his last name, uh, in the United States as a, an anti-Islam. He's an Islamophobe. He, he's, he's out there um, crusading against Islam since 9-11. And you suddenly see uh, the, uh, people gather like at any a, a, any of such event on Times Square, and people start reacting slowly. And suddenly the tide turns. You know, like he's completely drowned out by <clears throat> the famous Beatle line: "All the all you need is love." So, so um, I think that for me, the best the best documentaries. Um, um, are not only ones with uh, a strong point of view, but with a strong story. And, and so this is what I, I want to show you again today, how, you know, it's not because you have something, a message to send that you can't have, um, you can't do it in a way that is um, poetic and, and, and how should we say it? Like it, 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 touch, it it has a much, a much bigger impact. It has almost the impact of what a personal documentary has. By the way, a personal documentary is the other reason why you want, as a journalist, you want to do documentaries because that's also something you can't get away with in the news. You know, you can't you can't air your own personal uh, beefs or your own personal story. Generally, you're there to be the transmission of what Mr. and Mrs. Joe Blow are, are thinking, um, but. Um, I, I forgot where I was going with that, but um, oh, because you know the integrity. We, I, I've mentioned this before. Um, documentary is becoming more and more popular because um, people feel they can trust it, and it's not because you know, like it's it's quite um, shall we say ironic that the mainstream media to be trusted needs to say we are objective. We do not have a bias. We show all sides, and of course they have to do that. Um, which does not mean that they do not choose the information they show, and therefore there is always a bit of a bias, uh, no matter how technically objective. Um, but here, the pretense of objective, you do not no longer have the pretense of objectivity. Um, you, you just need to have a truth that you believe in and that you can show. You still have to prove it. You, have, you still have to show it uh, with, with as much uh, eloquence and means as you can. Um, and, and when you do, it is a story that carries far more weight than one that is so-called objective. It's true of a personal documentary, um, which is, you know, that it's the kind of documentary that never, you never get into trouble by doing a personal documentary. If it's your own personal story or someone's personal story, no one can attack you on that. A point of view, as you as we've just seen with a CBS, is attackable, especially if it's a hot social issue, and there are a lot of uh, people who think differently about you. Um, but I think there are ways of doing it that is totally inattackable. It, it's just like so wonderfully done, and I'm going to show you an example of that. Um, it is a pure gem, as far as I'm concerned. Of a POV, POV means point of uh, point of view. I will share my screen. Uh, why does it go to the end? Uh, hold on. Things okay. you should never mix with water. <laughs> Mascara. Uh, uh, uh. Mascara. Home electronic. Sodium metal. Witches. Okay. Sorry.
Sigmund Freud is one of the most revered and controversial people of the 20th century. Whether you like him or not, simply it's a matter of intellectual history. We have a lot to thank Freud for. He created a revolution in the way people think. Sigmund Freud's theory. I'm not a scorned woman. I think she was hysterical. Shrill and almost unhinged. Come down, dear. Listen to the doctor. Your first film? Yes. Oh, wow. oh no, I'm nervous. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> The patient, whom I will call Dora, was a girl of engaging looks. She was in the first room of youth, but she was a source of heavy trials for her parents. One day, her parents were alarmed to find a letter in which she said she could no longer endure her life. It was determined, in spite of her reluctance, that Dora should come to me for treatment. It started with my suicide note. No, it was before that, when my father decided we should all move to the mountains for clean air and tourists. For my mother, nothing changed. She still spent all day polishing. <laughs> I don't know what she polished. But for my father, everything changed. Pina had one of those plump asses that men love. And she was cool. She didn't care what kind of trash I watched or how much I smoked. I can't really blame my father for falling in love with her. Her husband was Hans. Hans was always nice to me. He used to bring me flowers and little gifts. He gave me this jewelry box once. I loved it. No one had thought any harm of it. The big event every year was this church parade. For some reason, all us Jews loved watching the priests and choir boys march by. Hans's office had the best view. He invited me to come watch with him and Pepina. But when I got there, he was all alone. He started closing all the shutters. I thought, how will we see the parade? Then he grabbed my wrist and pulled me up against him and started kissing me. I was 13. This was just the situation to call up a distinct feeling of sexual excitement. But instead, Dora had a violent feeling of disgust. I had on a brand new pair of sneakers. They were so stiff. I remember looking down and thinking they were stitched to the carpet. But then my feet started to move. I left the bathroom, went down the same stairwell, through the living room, and left the house. I remember being on the street and feeling an enormous sense of relief that I had escaped that house. 
for a very long time, I was too afraid and ashamed to tell anyone these details. After that, I'd make up excuses not to be alone with him. Stomach aches, homework, anything. Nevertheless, Dora continued to see him. Why in God's name would you ever speak to a man like that the rest of your life? I was afraid of retaliation. At 14, I was not able to make those kind of choices. Well, women are still labeled liars and troublemakers, and you just can't take a joke. I was scared. This was a governor. One of the things that I have come to understand about harassment, that this response, this kind of response, is not atypical. And I can't explain. It takes, it takes an expert in psychology to explain how that can happen. She kept the little scene in Han's office a secret. A few years later, Pepina had invited us to come stay at their lake house. It was one of those perfect summer days. Hans convinced me to go for a boat ride with him, and then we walked along the shore together. It was nice. He leaned in to light my cigarette. He had the smell. Like sunscreen and pine needles. I remember exactly what he said. I get nothing out of my wife. I don't know how I found my way back. I went to my room and shut the door. But when I woke up later, he was standing next to my bed. I asked him what the fuck he wanted. Her behavior was completely hysterical. My father confronted him, and you know what he said? I could not imagine anything that I said or did that could have been mistaken for sexual harassment. And then everyone turned on me. First, Pepina. Oh, it was so brave for this woman to come forward. Oh, give me a break. And my father. I find the references to the alleged sexual harassment the product of fantasy. Her father told me, please, bring her to reason. Dr. Hill, there's a plot. I know that sounds crazy. You're probably thinking, oh my God, this poor girl is really flipped. But I, I haven't flipped, Dr. Hill, I swear. By all the saints, I haven't. Freud believed me. He actually believed me. He was the first one, the only one. I told him that Hans had given me a jewelry box. I kept it on my desk for forever, longer than I should have. Do you know that jewel case is an expression for the female genitals? Hans gave you a jewel case, so you feel you need to give him your jewel case. No way. It was becoming clear. For all these years, she had been in love with Hans. She was more afraid of herself and the temptation she felt. That is the thought which had to be repressed. No. Her no was only a sign of the severity of the repression. Now let me ask you this, though. You indicated that you repressed a lot. Look, she was down with it. You brought it on yourself. What does that make her? It makes her a slut, right? I said it again and again, but he wouldn't listen. Dora persisted in denying my interpretation. She was motivated by jealousy and revenge. Did it occur to you that people would suspect your motives? This whole two-week effort has been a calculated and orchestrated political hit. It's simply dirty politics. Every famous, powerful, or wealthy person is a target. Are right. women born with a special gene for telling the truth and men with a special gene for lying? The fact that the hysteria has nothing to do with you means that we should ask, what's the hysteria coming from? I happen to know Hans. He was quite young and attractive. You have to keep in mind, this is law graduate from one of the four or five best law schools in this land. Ms. Hill was disappointed and frustrated that Mr. Thomas did not show any sexual interest in her. 
When I reported the problem, my supervisors didn't take it seriously. One of them told me I was giving sexual appeal to him. Her behavior must have seemed incomprehensible to Hans from the innumerable signs that he had secured her affections. Did I send out signals when I went to his office to watch the parade? Or when I went out on the lake with him? I don't think so. No. Until finally, just when my hopes of a successful treatment were highest, she opened the next session with these words. I am done. I left Freud, and it felt good to walk out of that dark cave. From those statues, always looking down on me, watching me like a ghost. I finished writing, and today I feel short of a drug. And then Freud embalmed me. I was his Dora, preserved like a dead animal and hung on a wall for study and observation. It is the subtlest thing I have written and will put people off even more than usual. But one does not write only for one's time. Unable to control her own forbidden sexual desires, Dora falls into a powerful hysteria. Through Freud's genius, the roots of Dora's problem are completely revealed to the reader. Only my name isn't Dora, it's Ida. But none of that matters because everyone knows me as Dora. Freud's hysterical girl. But was I really hysterical? Am I hysterical now? Okay, so what did you think of that? <laughs> and, oh my god, this is wild. <laughs> I and plus um maybe it's TMI, but I walk I just walked home from work and three men made these weird um comments and someone I knew did a weird um greeting to me. So this just makes me feel almost nauseous, so it's crazy. I feel like it's like it's very timely. It's very timely. That's wow. Oh my goodness. Thank you for showing us this. So so what's the point of view? What's the point of view here? Anyone? I would say like pro woman and uh, against uh, masculine toxicity toxicity, I guess. <laughs> Well, it's it's the whole, not only is it the most brilliant rebuttal of Freud that I've seen, uh, it's particularly brilliant because she has amalgamated what has become a very, very hot social issue, the whole question of sexual aggression, how it boils down to almost always he said and she said, and she takes it back to the... <laughs> the great man who, th who, who, I mean, in this case, the he is Freud and the she is Dora. Uh, both are, are famous, uh, you know, I mean, we know, everyone knows who Freud is and everyone knows uh, that he, he's the one who, 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 who brought the idea that women are hysterical. Uh, hist uh, hist history comes from uterus, by the way. So uh, it's a definite female trait, according to Freud. 
And why is are we his, why are women hysterical because of repressed sexual desire? That's the that's the that's the big uh, thesis, which has gone a long way, which is still active today. And of course, it would not never have the same if 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 one had wanted to do that, and one might have thought about it like fifty years ago when we start when the whole feminist movement started criticizing Freud it would never have had the impact it has right now or the way she does it because of how she brings in without, you know, without going out of her way, like just throwing in uh, Anita Hill, you know, all these references that we've, uh, Christine Blasey Ford, the, the, the Kavanaugh thing. So she's bringing actual examples, today's examples to show how far this whole idea has come and how it's still working against women today. Um, so it is, it is like, you can't, you can't possibly, I mean, you can have, God knows there are a lot of people who do not believe um, that, you know, don't believe this point of view, the, the, the filmmaker's point of view, Hell, Brent Kavanaugh was was uh, was was named uh, you know supreme judge uh, supreme judge despite um, having a case of sexual aggression and assault against him um, brought forth. <clears throat> so, but at the same time, it's all like I said, it is so well done. It is so well done. You can't possibly, you can't possibly. Um, I mean, you can say, you know, I I, I don't care for it, but you can't possibly say that this, um, you, you can't attack it in any way, I think. Um, and, you know, just in the terms of storytelling, and this is always the point I'm making here because I think documentary is about storytelling. Uh, and even if you have a strong point of view, you need to be able to tell a story. Notice, notice that there are four levels to this story. The first level, briefly, and this is, you will have seen this a lot. People do, this has become a bit of a fad almost, but it, I think it works fairly well. The first level is you see the filmmaker being, you, you don't understand what you're seeing at first. At the very beginning, you see the film, it turns out the filmmaker, young girl, who's being made up, who's, who's putting her, having her makeup put on. We, we often see this like going behind the scenes of the filmmaking sort of thing. But it sort of introduces you to her as a character, which is good because she is really going to be a, quite a hell of a character. She's going to play Dora. And then of course, there's the whole, the whole we'll go back in history. We have the voice of Freud with the wonderful archives, wonderful archives, and the story unfolds about how, you know, the story of Dora going to, to see Freud brought by her family and how, you know, the whole interpretation, et cetera, the whole story of Dora with Hans and the interpretation of Freud. And, um, uh, and, and then you have the animation. So th there's, the, there's the filmmaker, there's the archives with the, the, the two characters, one being played by the filmmaker, the other one, the voice of Freud. Then you have the made up scenes, the ones that she makes up, and then you have animation. And it's, you know, a lot of people use animation, but it's almost seamless, the, how the animation runs into the archives or to the other scenes. It is, it, you never feel as if you're bouncing off something. It's it, just one thing brings on, uh, it's a question of rhythm. It's a question of knowing which place to choose, but there are those four levels at all times. And of course, there's a climax. When she finally yells, um, you know, um, I asked him, and this is obviously a made up line because she would, the real Dora, Ida, would not have said, I asked him what the fuck he wanted. <laughs> and um, then he calls her hysterical, right? So that everything goes up to that point. And it, 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 at that point, you know, of course, that it is. I mean, she's convinced you how much this is a made up interpretation, an intellectual in interpretation that has gone for, for centuries. I mean, for 150 years um, has been, you know, used to explain how women behave um, and, um, and how men behave too. So your comments, Barry, you always have something to say. 
So I've seen this before. I love this film. I and I think it's amazing. I don't believe it was nominated a, for an Oscar. Abbas, you saw the short. And, and it was listed, and somehow I don't think it made the list. And uh, sorry to bring you because I always think it's the, the like uh, I showed you a conversation. A conversation was is shortlisted for an Oscar, but this one isn't. Right. And but I think this, this was probably of all the uh, of all the films that I've seen. And I, I think we may have even shown some of this in class. Um, this is by far uh, the most interesting and, and one of the best films I've seen. But the question I have is, how is this different from fiction? Um, the, the, the material that she is using, it's not her story. Um, it is a great story about someone, uh, um, uh, from, from history, uh, and her interpretation of it. She's acting the part, uh, which Meryl Streep could also do, uh, but she's a documentary filmmaker. And I think what I love about the film is it blurs the, the different, I, I, I think, Fiction and documentary are two false categories increasingly because of point mm -hmm. of view. And uh, so I, this, this film for me has a foot in both camps. I would definitely call it a documentary and I, I love the way that you're using it, but it also makes me question uh, what we do with our craft. So I'll just leave it for that as a moment. Well, I, I think actually, um where documentary and fiction uh, are coming more and more together, it's it's not so much the point of view, it's the storytelling. It a documentary from you know, if you look at Nanook of the North, you know when it started, there wasn't much storytelling there. You know there was just, but but there was a lot of fiction track, in Nanook of the North. Yes, 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 made up stuff, um, but um, but all the, the all the stuff we love about uh, fiction, which is you know. Uh, leading characters, strong characters, people you identify with, music, uh, suspense, a climax, storytelling. It's all uh, documentary now does that. That's why it's so much more fun to do a documentary than to do a news report, really. It's, it's about, it's creative as well as being informational. Um, and also you get to put your point of view in uh, with more or less uh, like I, I, in the way that you want, um, uh, which is also a plus, you know, because I think actually people, uh, to, to go back to the reference that the CBC person was doing to a column comparing point of view in TV with column writing, I, 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 as a column writer, I know how people are hungry today to have people explain to them what they should be thinking, or at least help them, you know, make up their minds about something. Uh, and again, I think this is part of the appeal of documentary. Um, you know, if you do it right, there is a lot of integrity to the, to the process. Uh, you can feel that there, the, it's, it's, you feel you can trust that truth more almost than the, the so-called objective truth of the media because we don't pull any punches. We're going to tell you exactly where we're coming from. Um, uh, but also we're doing it in a way that takes you on a ride. And, and that's, that's the fun of it. And that's the beauty of it. Um, um I, yeah, please. Hello. Hi. Um, yes. I also thought that it touched a lot do, on do this turn, white folk syndrome. You, Raquel, do you want to turn your camera on? Uh, I don't have the best internet connection, so I usually function better with my camera off. But um, I thought that it touched interestedly on white coat syndrome, um, which I think is important because, yes, this is a, a situation that happened um, in this case due to kind of the, the prejudice towards women. But there's also studies that show that African-Americans are less likely to receive pain medication when they go to the hospital because of the false belief that they have a higher pain tolerance um, or, you know, People that have uh, abusive families very often get the, but you have to forgive your family. And I think that a lot of um, authority is put on doctors. And I know that other documentaries, um, I think Stanford Prison Experiment, to think of one off the top of my head, I think Milgram's may have been another, looked at white coat syndrome to help explain what happened in the Holocaust. So I thought that that was something interesting that this also touched on. So I'm not. I'm not sure I'm following you. You're saying this is what? Uh, white? What? White swinger? 
Um, white coat syndrome. White folk? Coat. A white, white coat. coat, like a doctor's white coat. A white coat. Um, okay. Okay. Yeah, uh, there's some very famous studies that looked at like, why did the Holocaust happen? Why do people respond to authority in the way that they do? And so uh, there's a couple really famous studies, like the Stanford prison experiment, um, and one where they, like I said, I think it's Milgram's, where they brought people in to do um, a test, and they basically had them believing that they were shocking the actor on the other side to see if in response to a doctor, if they would be willing to um, shock someone to the point where it would be lethal. Mm -hmm. Right, right. So you're saying, well, the, the, Freud is by definition the, the white coat, you know, uh, <laughs> par excellence, you know, like, uh, um, and his words were, were seen as, you know, like prophetic. He himself saw himself, as we see in the film, as prophetic. One doesn't only write for one's times, he says. Um, uh, but it has done, in this case, I mean, uh, uh, not to, not to uh, under, um, <laughs> not, not, not to say, you know, what happened during the Holocaust, but I mean, it, it had great consequences in terms of, of women's sexuality, essentially. Are there more questions or comments? Um, it's not. It's not a question, rather a comment. Uh, I really loved how uh, in, the, in the the documentary we used two point of view. Like the filmmaker used uh, uh, two points of view, like Dora's and as well as Freud's, so that you can see how wrong he is, how he uh, interpreted everything that uh, she used to say uh, into and made it into like uh, a sexual things. So I think that was a very important thing, uh, especially because it makes you understand that like have uh, a more wider view uh, to understand that it is his fault in that matter. And uh, one important thing that I really enjoyed about it, it's, it's short and uh, as, uh, as the other people said before, it, it has fiction as well as documentary which made us like made me personally um, interact more with the with the story and understand it a little bit more uh, because whenever, for example, I see a documentary with a lot of scientific facts and archives and stuff, it can make it a little bit hard for people to follow through. So having a story to tell and like a story that follows the same rules as fiction or as uh, movies and stuff like that made the movie a little bit easier to follow through. In my opinion, yeah, um, I think that, that not only should you follow the rules of good storytelling, if, uh, which is fiction telling, but it's any good storytelling. I mean, even when you do a good interview, you follow this, the the rules of good storytelling. You know, you expound, you introduce your subject, you start building the tension. There is a climax and there's a resolution. That's always even a conversation has that a good conversation. Um, but you're right in saying that, you know, that he's, I mean, she, he, she, the brilliance of this thing is that it's really simple. She's taken something fairly simple. The device is simple, girl, boy, man, woman, not only, not any just girl, boy, it's Freud and Dora, and it, which illuminates what is happening all over the world between them, <laughs> with, you know, to a certain extent, on that exactly. level. Exactly. I uh, it's really the time like it's timeless because it happened before but like the story repeats itself and at the end when she shows pictures of new uh protesters and stuff like that that really made it into yeah maybe it was a an old story but that story still happens it's the same story that happens every time. Exactly and that's the beauty of it she took something really simple and she augmented it with all the, you know, at the end when 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 you see the images and the women uh, screaming, you they're not hysterical, they're angry. It has changed, you know. And she has used the power of what happened then. I mean, the power of that story, Freud and Dora, with all the power of today. And she's melded it together. But it's it's you never miss a beat, even though she doesn't go out of her way to say now you're seeing this and now you're seeing that and. We know, we know what's happening without actually knowing every little detail. It is really a, like a simple idea with 
lots of things tacked into. Now I'm going to show you what I consider a bad example of point of view because there's so such a thing as too much point of view. Like just like, and again, it's a question of not finding a single device, a single idea, a single hanger on which you hang things for people to follow. I'm, we're not going to watch it all because it's long. And I want, to, I want to finish. Yes, does someone have something to say? Yes, I just want yes. to say, like, I really like this doc too. I watched it already before. And I, I, I like the, the emotional like, effect on, on me, for example, like with all the footage of like, all those men and, and everything that we can hear against women. I just feel like there is this, like the build, the filmmaker builds like this tension and like you feel oppressed, you feel attacked almost a soul because you hear everything and you can like feel what women can can feel too like by seeing like famous people being involved when you see Bill Clinton you're like this but you know like all this and I feel like you really go into their mind and that's really uh, that's really like what I really like in this doc is the the emotional like awareness and like you feel like boiling and like so scared and like yeah. it's, and the visuals are really fast so like it's really dynamic yeah yeah, yeah no it is it is brilliantly constructed and I must say that you know, for a filmmaker, she knows how to act too, so, which, does, which helps, you know, which makes you think, Barry, that it could be fiction, but she's, she's very talented, <laughs> she's very talented. So um, what I am going to show you now is also from very talented people, um, but it's just not, well, I will show it. And this is um, something, uh, it's called Message from the Future. And it was produced by Naomi Klein and her partner, Abby Lewis. And it's um, narrated by very famous people, Emma Thompson amongst them. So we're just gonna watch a little bit of it because it's long and... Um, not that long, but... Looking back, it's hard to believe that we've rebuilt our community from the ground up with our own hands. The first seeds were planted way back in the terror and tenderness of the pandemic. And then change bloomed in the streets, in the fire and struggle of the uprisings. Around here, we'll never forget the day that the last prisoners were released, walking out into the arms of their loved ones. The easy part was finding work. The Community Care Corps was always looking for people in those days, whether for universal family care, burying border walls, or green new public housing going up one pod at a time. Yep, it was a good time for busy hands. Funny, thinking back to the first wave of the pandemic, that's what you really remember. Hands, washing, scrubbing, disinfecting, washing again, picturing each other's hands, all the hands that had touched whatever we were touching, the hands that packed the box, that picked the tomato, that planted the seed, the hands that stroked the brow, that said goodbye. The hands were us, all of us. That web of hand-to-hand, -hand, breath breath-to-breath relationships was a reminder. We are all entangled, making each other sick, keeping each other alive. That was just one of the lessons of COVID-19. It started in the first great pause, when the smog cleared and the rich fled the cities, when poverty dropped its disguise and racist inequality drew the map of the disease. As the roar of the traffic faded, we arose to birdsong an ambulance sirens. The virus showed us what was truly essential. And we learned again and again that so many of us doing essential work were being treated as sacrificial. From nursing homes to detention facilities, meatpacking plants and fulfillment centers, the virus exposed the cruelty of these warehouses of efficiency and profit. Then things got worse. In 2023, super droughts led to mega floods. Locusts carved a path across continents and hyper typhoons drove millions from their homes. COVID-23 raced through storm shelters and refugee camps, 
supplies ran out again. Meanwhile, dinosaurs roamed the halls of power, bellowing that more sacrifice was needed. But every time they cranked up that rusty old machine called economic growth, the cloud of sickness and death grew. And we couldn't breathe. Couldn't breathe from the asthma in our polluted communities, from the smoke of those fires. We couldn't breathe with a knee on our necks in the clouds of tear gas as we shouted, Black Lives Matter. And that is how the virus changed everything. We finally understood that we couldn't keep patching up the same broken systems. We had to build something new. What was needed was a spark. That spark was us. After months of organizing, the viral rent strike was like a starting gun. Then came the essential worker strike. Delivery drivers, street cleaners, and farm workers got together and said, enough. This time, people didn't just clap from their balconies. We flooded into the streets to join together. One of the leaders was Lucy Ella, a young food courier. When a police bullet stole her life, the crowds exploded in size and then exploded again, spreading across borders like a counter virus. The sparks look different in every country as the wildfire strikes leapt across borders. Economies ground to a halt, this time blockaded by workers. We lost too many young heroes as states brought out the iron fist, but it was no match for the rest feast of solidarity. Soon, authoritarian rulers started to topple like statues, and new governments were suddenly nervous about ignoring the streets. We joined hands and pushed further, launching the years of repair. The first step was rebuilding the economy around the core of essential work, food and farming, care for young and old, public health. Not to mention the essential labor of the more than human world, the winged pollinators, the leafy oxygen makers. The Full Employment Act made the new priorities clear and there was a wave of new worker cooperatives in everything from mental health support to public art and tree planting. Many bosses were made redundant. Our information ecology needed tending too. And so we built a digital commons, vaccinated it against surveillance and built up our herd immunity to disinformation. Fossil fuels were running on fumes by that point. So we harnessed their final profits to clean up their messes. Whatever we could, we did outdoors. School, theatre, celebrating. At first, because it was safer. Then, because we realised it made us happier. Nobody talked about missing shopping. Anyway, the right to repair movement meant that a lot of stuff got fixed rather than thrown away, replaced. With life moving at a slower pace, we finally had time to look back. And we began the most important repair of all, repairing relationships. In colonial countries like the US, Canada, Australia and the UK, those were hard conversations. But truth and reparations commissions helped some of us face the truth about the violent conquests of the past and how they shaped our world. That guided where we repaired and how. It turned out that once we fully funded Okay, I'm gonna stop it there because it's, <clears throat> we don't quite have enough time. Uh, all right, <clears throat> so your impression of that. I don't really get everything in this one. <laughs> kind of like, and the second part with like this big fiction part, because it's like, we don't have, like, I, we all wish it's gonna be like that, but like, uh, it's not, yeah, it's weird because like, it's like projecting stuff, 
but like we're used to see facts and like stuff that happened and like so yeah it's weird i don't really know what to think about it to be honest uh, um in my opinion it was a bit too much like uh, too many information at once and that made it a little bit hard to follow because they wanted to tackle every situation that happened in covid but that is a very uh, broad subject and topic to talk about. So the fact that they try to talk about every point of view possible with the Black Lives Matter and then the uh, economy and stuff like that, it was a really hard uh, thing to follow through. Yeah. Um, any other comments? Um, I loved the way that it took what was this and is a factual situation and then used it to paint this imagined future, but present it as if it was fact. So I thought that that was wonderfully creative. Um, what I did think though, is that they presented this hyper optimistic view of like, and then we all came together. And, and I think that clashes against looking at this past year and how much we didn't come together. Um, you know, the, the ideal, and, and it's been presented in films over and over as if we were presented with a global crisis, it would be this great unifying thing. And that's not what we've seen. What we've seen is attacks on Asian Americans and you know, inequity and all of these other things kind of explode against this situation. So I think it was super interesting, but I think it, it also presented this idealism that clashes hard against the factual situation that yeah. we see in front of us. Yeah, um, yes. So I think there, are, for me, there are many problems and you've, all of them, you, you've pointed to many of them. First of all, there's a piling on of stuff, you know, like when you say, you know, keep it simple, like keep, find one idea and, you know, bring it home. Uh, I think it, it, this is a case in point of how not to go about it because there's a piling on of you know so many things that happened during the pandemic, uh, all the things we've discovered, the so the essential workers, the the inequality, uh, and then racism, which is actually uh, you know an added uh, um, uh, an added uh, layer, and then of course there's the idea that despite all this grimness, we, the, we, in the future, we will, as Raquel just pointed out, we will miraculously, uh, because we have learned our lessons so well, we will miraculously, uh, you know, be a, a better uh, place and better people, which of course is totally unbelievable, uh, but essentially it's bad storytelling. It's, it's, there's really an, an, an over, it's over, it's over, it's really laying it on way too thick, um, and 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 you know, and finally, I think too, um, you know, I think it is very hard to tell a story with with that kind of animation from beginning to end because it adds to the bewilderment. We're just trying to keep up with ideas, and the hand is telling us you're never going to keep up <laughs> because it's going ever ever so fast. And so it's it's just it just adds to our rule. Oh my God, like uh, stop the world already. <clears throat> There's it's too much. So I I I don't think it's it's. Uh, I mean I think it's it was meant as a tool to be used in various situations to discuss things. But even there, I think um, it would have been better to take um, you know one thing at a time and try to uh, make make the point. Also, I think it's very hard to tell a story without characters, you know. Um, this is not, for me, it's an exposition of all kinds of things, but it is not a story. Um, and therefore it's not, it's not a successful little film, uh, despite the fact that it's, you know, it, it's on, a, it's on a, an, an, another, another level, shall we say, on an animated, short animated level, but nevertheless. I think it's it's too bad because there is a lot of um, I think there could have been I don't know I don't know why they they insisted on wanting to you know to bite off more than they could chew Barry what do you think No I, I agree with you completely and I've been trying to think of if the 
objective of this film was to get people to think how could what we're going through make a uh, make a better place in other words it could be it could have been dystopian but instead it's utopian um and i think there's a lot of ways that could be done uh and i agree with you there's just too much stuff that's thrown at us uh and at at at, at some point although uh i agree to a certain extent with a lot of the stuff that uh uh, both of them do. I just found the, this overwhelming and I wanted to say, I was waiting for you to cut it off. I, I was waiting <laughs> to say enough. Yeah, no, it, 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 it's really very, it's every time I've come to watch it, I've, I've, I, I've, had, I've had trouble like sticking with it because it's, it's just, um, it's nobody's story and you're never sure what point, I mean, first of all, it starts off with, uh, you know, uh, we wanted, uh, what, what is it? Um, it? It's after, it, it, it starts with, we have, we've planted new seeds. This is, it's, we're already in the future. And then we're back in a prison. We don't understand what, who are the prisoners coming out of prison? And then we're, oh, okay, the pandemic. Okay, we understand with the pandemic, the hands, da, da, da. Then there's a bunch of stuff about the pandemic. And then finally, where they want to take us, which is, we can build, from this, we can build a better world, but by then they've lost everyone, and we don't quite believe um, that we that we've learned a <laughs> lesson, as as Raquel again has pointed out. So, I want to finish this um, workshop with the best uh, uh, again uh, a student film, another one of my student films, uh, just to show you that you can do it. It's uh, anyone, you know. It's it's. It's available to anyone who has a good story to tell and the heart and the reason and the, you know, the determination to do it. So this is, uh, was done by uh, Matt D'Amour, who's now a uh, CBC, got him a job right away. Uh, you might know him very, um, he was a number one student uh, in Concordia a few years back and was immediately hired by the CBC. I'm, I'm not surprised. So here is the documentary he did in my 532 class. I think it was two, three years ago. It's called Being Lily. Oh, it's me. I think to say that oh. Jen. Mm -mm. Sorry. I think to say that gender is not based on identity is to gloss over the massive diversity. There's no singular womanhood. eventually going to need to come out. I was totally worried that things were going to go terribly and I was, you know, going to have to like move out or something. It's really common for me to receive really disrespectful tweets, comments on my videos, stuff like, you know, you'll never be a real one or kill yourself, that kind of thing. Transness in our society is one of the least desirable things. Like, I don't expect it to just be okay, ever, which sucks, but I mean, what can you do, I guess?
so that's done. There's a lot of things in here that people have just like given me to be nice, but but they're like way too small. Like, you know. This does not exactly fit me. A lot of my wardrobe didn't change after I like, you know, came out and all that. Just pants and stuff. I don't know. Some fun shorts in there. I mean, for most of my life I was really confused about, you know, the whole gender thing. Until I was probably 16, I hadn't given it much thought at all. Being masculine wasn't something that came naturally to me, but I, I didn't know what else to, I didn't know what to replace it with, you know? I was definitely confused, and I knew that something wasn't right, but I, I wasn't sure what. So I've only been out for uh, seven months or something, um, publicly. I've been out to like friends and family since, oh, yeah, about a year. I always knew it was going to have to happen eventually. I always knew I was eventually going to need to come out. Once summer of last year hit, I realized that it was like, it was urgent. It was like an important thing to me. When you internalize that kind of thing for so long, your brain makes up anything, you know? It, it creates its own ideas of what could and couldn't happen. And I was totally worried that things were going to go terribly. And I was, you know, going to have to like move out or something. But of course, logically, that wouldn't happen, knowing my family. Um, we had, it was last summer, it was in July, and uh, we just finally finished watching the Amy Winehouse documentary, which we'd been wanting to watch for years. Um, and right when we got to the end of the film, um, Lily turned to us and says, uh, I, have, I have news, I have an announcement to make. I just told them, there's something I've been meaning to tell you for like, you know, several months, and I should probably just tell you, I'm trans. And they were very supportive. It took some time, but you know, it was good. Yeah, I think I'm so cool and everything, but I'm totally not cool. I, I was totally stunned and I, I got up and I went to the kit. I, I was like, oh, okay. And then I went in the kitchen and was like, oh my God. <laughs> but like it just it just totally threw me off and at first I thought oh it's 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 a phase and then I thought oh yeah like vegetarianism was a phase for this kid at nine she decided that that was it no more meat and here we are at 17 and still vegetarian and so I just thought oh crap this kid doesn't have phases this is for real and then I cried for two weeks and then I thought this is great. It's a, it's the beginning of this kid that was struggling and unhappy and really stressed out, figuring out who she is and blossoming. Should I just go for it? For the few years leading up to my like realization that I was trans, I felt totally out of touch. Nothing felt real, I guess. And I thought it would be like this. And I thought I would come to the artifacts of heat on this. I wasn't treated like a girl. I mean, I didn't know I was one for Christ's sake. And beyond that, it was it was the physical things that I didn't realize. You know, the the physical traits of like what you think a girl is supposed to look like. I I didn't realize that I wanted that at the time. I just sort of hated my body and didn't know why. Um, she went through a period of anorexia, where suddenly she was. Um, just eating maybe a third of what she should be or what she had been. 
I wanted to lose weight in order to have like a more feminine appearance, basically. I, I just, you know, I wanted to be slimmer and not in a masculine way. So that's like, to me, one of the first signs that I was struggling. Early high school was a nightmare for her. Like I would drive her just to school and she would have panic attacks every day day in the car. In puddles of sweat I found one But I felt like a void in my own home Because then I, I started going back and thinking about things and then it all started clicking together and making sense and I thought we could have just saved you so much trouble if, if we had noticed this earlier. One of them was in the shoe store. There was this pair of rainbow sparkly sandals that really caught her eye. And she had to have those sandals and cried and cried when we didn't buy them. And I think back like, why didn't I just buy the sandals? Why, you know? When I started college, I still hadn't changed my name on Facebook or like come out on Facebook. Early on in your transition, you need to come out to every single person you meet because they're not going to assume, they're not going to know, you know? People, in my case at least, seem to like show support at first and then a couple weeks later, a couple months later, then they'll start bombarding me with a lot of, can I swear? A lot of bullshit. Um, from the bottle, I put on when I came back to my grandmother, it was over email because she lives in Ontario, and she she was just telling me how proud she was and how she was like excited for me, and she hasn't talked to me since then. She's talked to my mother about me and said some disgusting things, just really you know, really hateful, really disrespectful. You're delusional. I'm not gonna respect this. Get help, you know. I'm not attached enough to her to care, honestly, but it's stuff, it's stuff I expected. She's really struggling, my mom. She hasn't been able to say the name Lily. The whole sticks and stones thing, right? If you're not actively hurting me, then I can, I can just keep away from what the stuff you're spewing, you know? I'm a lot more upset about how you treat people, how society treats people than like whatever lazy insults I've already heard a million times, you know? Yeah, I finally actually said, you've got to get used to this because this is the new reality and if, if you can't get used to it, you're going to lose us. Like, so here I thought that we were going to lose her, but actually, no, it's the other way around. We're, we're not going to stick around for bullshit, you know? So I'm also very active on Twitter. I'll get in a lot of conversations, maybe verging on arguments with, with folks on there. It's really common for me to receive, you know, just really disrespectful tweets, uh, stuff like, You'll never be a real woman. Kill yourself, that kind of thing. You know, your classic internet trolling. It's, it's something I've adapted to, because you need to. Otherwise, if you don't adapt to like people being terrible, if you're trans, you're gonna lose your mind. That's a thing. So, um, yeah, I have no problem getting in these arguments with people, um, mostly just because I wanna educate people, because people, have a lot of information missing when they talk about these kind of things. Straight up misconceptions about trans people, like just like bam, 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 one after the other. I could go on for hours about this alone. <laughs> okay, for starters, all trans people are trans women, meaning assigned male at birth, transition to become, become women. Not true, trans men also exist. Non-binary people also exist. Um, secondly, all trans women are straight, 75% of trans women are not straight, 77%, something like that. Um, third, trans women are pedophiles. I don't even need to debunk that one. 
Um, I mean, you, you know the whole bathroom issue. <sighs> There's been no let up in the anger, battles, and protests in North Carolina over its new LGBT bathroom law. State lawmakers passed HB2 to nullify a Charlotte ordinance permitting people to use public bathrooms based on their gender identity. Back in 2010. Dan Forrest is North Carolina's lieutenant governor. It would allow any man to go into any women's restroom, girls' locker room, uh, women's shower, or girls' shower facility, and be able to uh, get away with it. The life and the protection of one woman, one child related to this is so important to keep it a price tag. Anyone who's different in our society will sometimes get, get targeted. Um, so someone who is trans, someone who's gay, someone who is just doesn't fit into, into the, the conservative norm will sometimes get picked on by, by various groups. I think that trans people are disproportionately mentally ill. I think, first off, a lot of those mental health issues are not our fault, obviously because of the enormous pressure that is placed on people to conform to gender expectations. And transness in our society is one of the least desirable things. Like, if every time you walked outside your door, someone like screamed into your face, like you're worthless, you know, it's going to cause you some problems and that is not your fault. So yeah, a lot of trans people are mentally ill, but first off, I don't think it's entirely our fault. Second, what's the problem there? The way healthcare is set up for trans people, it wasn't made for us. So for trans feminine people like me, typically what will happen is you'll get a medication to block your testosterone production and then you'll get a medication to produce, or you'll get estrogen, right? Um, so I'm like, I've got one down, but I don't have the estrogen yet. It's a matter of time. It's a huge pain in the ass to get that kind of thing. Most cases require two psychiatrist notes, I believe. Um, and they require several months of like people following you and asking you these questions that they shouldn't necessarily be asking you to be figuring this stuff out. One example of a question that psychiatrists, I believe in the US ask, is they ask if you feel like a desperate need to like change your genitals. That does not apply to everybody. A lot of trans people don't need or want any surgery at all. So notions like those are decades old. I did something that was against the rules to get hormones or to get on the path to hormones because I didn't want to spend the six months to two years you know, waiting in lines, uh, getting CLOC's therapist because I can't afford like a private one. So there's a handful of doctors in the country that'll um, they'll just ask you a couple very simple questions, then they'll prescribe you something if, if your blood tests come back, right? Um, but they only accept adults. I may or may not have pretended to be an adult to get, <laughs> to get access to this healthcare it's not something I feel bad about because everyone should have access to healthcare, you know? I think, I think the thing that's, that's even a little bit dangerous is that if kids don't get support at this critical stage in their, in their development, that it could, it could wreak havoc on their, on them in, in the future. I think it's, it's really important that if kids are going to be brave enough to, to come out um, and, and declare themselves trans, they should have all the support that they could, they could possibly receive. Are you the same person, but the gender identification is different? Do you see person like what's... Right. Um, side note, I would rather you didn't like use the name in the documentary, okay. you know? Um, I don't want to be associated with that name anymore because it wasn't actually me. Just like I never was like a dude, you know? Like I never really, that was never really my name in a way. It was just, it feels stupid to say this. It's sort of just what people called me. And like there, it, it never hit the nail on the head. It's bugged me that friends, like close friends will still say and still say he and knowing you know that they shouldn't be and I, I just feel like get the fuck on board already felt vibration deep beneath my skin felt like coming home and
Video stuff is just my passion. Like it's first and foremost a release, but it's also as a means of like two-way communication, you know, getting message out to people, having them come back to me and say, this is what I think of this. And then, you know, engaging in like an actual productive dialogue. As YouTubers, I think we've got to start embracing the bad ideas. Bad ideas, bad execution is what brings us to good ideas and hopefully better execution. You can learn a lot through experimentation. You can learn a lot through mistakes. You can learn a lot through awful concepts that don't work out at all. As an artist, I think the worst thing you can do for yourself is not allow yourself to make mistakes. So let's make mistakes. Please subscribe. Dustin's great because we've got a really good queer association. So that's that's like a really vital resource for, for all queer people, myself included, obviously. People need a place where they can like rely on to be safe, you know? always found it really easy to get stuck, you know, or to feel stuck at least. If I have a bad week, I just accept it as the new normal, like, oh, I guess this is how I am now, for good. Uh, not giving myself the chance to change. With early transition stuff, I just, it's really easy to get stuck in the mindset of, I guess I'm gonna be this way forever, I'm never gonna look the way I wanna look. Obviously it's not true, these things just happen slowly, they just take time. You know, happiness. You're happy, you know you're happy. Not much to add there. Sadness and like anger, there's a lot more to like uncover there. And I, I can't do that on my own, honestly. I don't have a, I can't afford a therapist, so I have a guitar. That was so, that was so pretentious. That was so pretentious. You know what I mean, though? Mm -mm. Okay. Thoughts, comments, criticism. It was amazing, though, like, that we need more stuff like that. <laughs> And, uh, and I like it a lot because it's not only like denouncing, it's not only like showing the negative part of being who you want to be, but it's also like giving a lot of information to people who might not be aware. And there's a lot of like solution journalism into this doc of like teaching people through Lily, like, and even though when they like recap everything, you know, like first, second, third, or like destroying all the prejudices or like, that's powerful. That's powerful and also like alarming about like, so I, I, didn't, I didn't quite understand if it was in the States or in, the, in Canada. No, it's in Canada. Ah, oh, okay. Canada. Well, it's not that bad as like States though, <laughs> that's sad. But like also showing like the, the lack of awareness to like from the politicians too and like the mental care, uh, the mental care and, and uh, the health care and uh, it was really good. And like denouncing, but also like providing information and teaching people about it. And, uh, and the visuals are amazing though. When they had mm -hmm. like, cameras before COVID. <laughs> yeah, the, that was, uh, <clears throat> yes, that helped. Um, other comments? I found huh. that I liked the like very personal approach. You know, the, like the whole thing was pretty much in the bedroom. And it, at first I was like, oh, um, are we, are we missing action? Are we gonna just end up being like, say long, you know? But it's, it's such a sensitive topic, right? So we're not gonna run around and interview at the mall and stuff. It's the person in bed and it's just so, um, we don't deal with, the, with that, but the way he filmed and the questions he asked and 
it just makes it relatable on certain levels and it's interesting mm -hmm. and I also like them when he captured you know um uh Lily putting on makeup because I don't know if you notice sometimes Lily holds the brush and uh, like Lily will hold the brush like this sometimes and she'll put lipstick like this too and it just and the title of that um sequence was like transition and it just shows like wow yes a transition like <laughs> you know Matt, yeah he's learning she's learning how to put makeup on yeah, yeah. Um, uh, for me, yeah. Sorry. Okay, yeah. so uh, I joined the same idea of the personal thing. It really was interesting to see her just sitting in the bed. So like, you, there's no distance between us as uh, viewers and her. Uh, we mm -hmm. feel close to her. We can relate to her and empathize with whatever is going on with her life. And that was really interesting for me. Um, I also loved how she, how the filmmaker was present, but he wasn't overwhelming. He was there, like you can feel his presence, uh, for example, when he asked a couple questions or with the camera movement, but he was he was there as a, as more of a catalyzer of the discussion rather than, oh yeah, I'll ask rigid questions and you have to answer it. He lets her talk about the things that uh, she wanted to talk about. He may lead the discussion, but the, the subjects was her and the family. And the, the most important thing that I really liked about it is the evolution, uh, because he uh, parted the movie into four, three categories, three parts. And that shows a little bit of the transition, the dealing with the stuff and the evolution. And the, we can actually find that she evolved from the beginning of the movie to the end of it. She was, she was in the beginning, she was not uh, comfortable uh, talking to the camera and stuff like that. But like at the end, she was just, for example, in the beginning, she was like, oh, uh, do I have the permission to curse, to say uh, bad words? And at the end, she does, doesn't give a, a damn about it. And she just goes ahead and just be herself, like her true self. So that is one of the things that actually uh, I enjoyed and like made me react throughout the whole movie because it, it made her like evolve and like you can see how her parents as well and like how she uh, transformed into her real person at the end. Like, and that was really uh, very, thin, like a very innovative way to go for it, especially with these kind of subjects because people rather go for, oh yeah, they're struggling, it's a bad thing. Uh, they go through struggles and it's a very hard subject and stuff. But she went and she explained her personal experience and how, of course she struggled, but the struggle had a, uh, it has a very uh, conclusion at the end, like a very important conclusion, which is that she felt like herself, at least like at the end, she is herself. So that was interesting to see. Yeah. Uh, any more comments? Yeah. I just uh, want to say the other people said a lot of points that I wanted to say, but I really enjoyed the structure of the documentary that it was along, I mean, it was in a very good harmony with the concept of transfer. And I mean, um, I don't know how to say the structure that we, um, how the movie was transferred us to the different parts of his, uh, her life. It was like the uh, change that it's uh, going to, uh, to, be, to that the change that we saw at the end of the movie, I mean, uh, mm -hmm. The structure was really um, um, with ha in, ha in harmony uh, with, the, with the concept. And uh, I liked it because um, uh, I think um, some, some, some concepts are very complicated to, to show how people think that in the different times, but with this structure, we could, we could find the details of his life, uh, of her life, and I enjoyed it. I enjoyed the structure, the, how they come, uh, for example, the described family, different parts, um, some pictures that is used between the uh, different parts of her, her, her path in this documentary. I like the structure. I think it's a very, um, I want to show to you, well, first of all, there is a point of view, it's not, uh, it's not the, the same as what we've seen, but there's a definite point of view because um, it's a clearly uh, an exposition of why uh, trans, 
uh, women or trans people, like the whole point to it, you know, the whole, it's, it's a very uh, sympathetic uh, view of it by just letting uh, Lily explain her whole journey and, and who she is, et cetera, et cetera. But it, it so there's a strong point of view, but again, there's a real simple, it's very simple, it's a complex notion, it's a complex reality, but told very simply. And it's told again, it's a classic three act play. It's classic storytelling. You know, the first part is simply Lily. And I agree that having her film in her bed with the guitar was, was, a, a, was really, really, uh, you know, a, a, a very strong thing to do because you feel close to her. Uh, you feel that, you know, you feel you get to know her that way. And music is always, of course, very poetic and, and, and brings you in. But so the first part is simply Lily saying why she didn't feel, she, you know, why she, she needed to do this, how she, did, she went about it. The second part is there's tension. Every good story has tension, the bullshit. The grandmother is not on board. Then all the, the prejugé that, that there is out there of, that she has to deal with. Personally, I think he could have pushed that a little bit further because I think it could have been even more striking. But you know, I think he he was letting Lily call the shots. I don't think he was asking a lot of questions actually. Um, um, and then finally, the resolution, which of course is absolutely key because we've seen, we see her physically change in the resolution, in the, in the third act. She's already into hormones and she, you can see the, the fem, feminization of her and that she's grown in more ways than one. Um, and she's also talking about, she's, she's working, she, you know, she's doing stuff. She's got a career already with a camera and, and stand-ups and, and, and blogs or whatever. So it's very simple. Um, but it's a lot, you know, it brings you, it, there's a climax and there's a resolution. And, and then the shooting, the third thing is there's a point of view, there's a strong storyline and the shooting, sh shooting in the bed, shooting her like close up, just a, a still face, shooting her walking in the, in the corridors, walking shots pay off a great deal. Uh, the guitar is also a great plus. And notice how he shot this is quite interesting, actually. I've never seen a couple. It's hard to to shoot two people when you're doing an interview, two people at once. Generally, you try. It doesn't work often very well, and it's it works. It oddly works, I think. There, he's he, the way he positioned them for one thing uh, was was really really interesting. There was something like it. It felt really as if the husband was listening to the wife. Uh, they felt like that compliments to not, another, not just like sort of awkward adjuncts to one another. Um, it, it was, uh, yeah. Um, so there was there was a lot of things. Yeah, Barry? Briefly, yeah, I thought the composition of that was excellent. Also the lighting that he did. He actually focused yes. the lighting in such a way so that the mother was backlit a little bit and yes. the father on the side, uh, his whole framing and composition throughout showed a tremendous control. And I agree, it's very hard to do uh, two. Um, and either they're right at each other, talking to each other, but in this case, having one slightly off and the other full on, excellent, beautiful, beautiful scenes. It was beautifully done. Yeah, it was beautifully done. And of course, I mean, the, the first thing is, of course, why this works is he knew he had a gold mine with Lily. You know, you need a strong character who can tell a story. Lily delivers in spades, in spades, like 17 year old. And really, it's quite amazing, right? So that's the first thing. But the other thing is making sure, is structuring your, like th that, you, you know, the like a, a Russian doll, you know, things come out slowly but surely. And it feels as if it's, you're not wrenching it open. It feels naturally. It feels it's happening naturally, even though none of this is really natural, of course. Um, so. So yeah, so I'm, uh, it's, and again, this was done in 13 weeks, but less. So um, for all of you who are hard at work there, take heart, everything is possible. Uh, any more questions, comments? I had a question, Francine. Um, I don't know if you watch, um, for example, me, I love watching uh, Lisa Ling's like episode of uh, Our America and Life with Lisa Ling, but it's, um, 
what's the do you feel like there's a difference in effect when the person that asks questions is also filmed versus when you're behind the cameras asking questions oh yes there's a big difference generally generally in documentary you don't put the person asking the questions in the in the film unless there's a reason for it unless you are part of the film but if you're not part of the film you're just there to push the buttons so that uh you know the the right stuff comes out that you want the stuff to come out you don't want to see the person pushing the button that's that's tv news that's 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 not documentary i mean but sometimes there is documentaries for example um you know like uh, um you know his name um barry help me here the guy that did the fog of war um uh, er errol morris okay so it's essentially uh, the fog of war is is uh, essentially a long interview with uh, Mac uh, robert mcnamara who was the secretary of state uh during the vietnam war and and every once in a while you hear uh Aaron morris pitch a question at him from the back you know like at that point he needs to barge in because he wants to take him by the lapels essentially you know sort of thing but otherwise um there the, you know you have to you have to think about this like if there's a if they're they're in generally in documentary you are going and this is a good example with lily for cinema verite you're letting the situation talk for itself you're there of course it's documentary so you're you're there to set things up and make things happen uh but you to to show that th there has to be a reason to show that in the same way as the filmmaker in hysterical girl showed herself being made up there That's you can fine. you can decide you can decide to go behind the scenes and and show the construction that's that's part of you know it's a it's a device it's a that's narrative true. device that's what I'm asking, but, why do we choose to you know that you know why why does someone uh, and a good interviewer choose to be in the shots or be in the show but physically and be a part of the characters like why would you well because it's a it's a it's a it's a tv convention mm, okay. that is that is that is used in tv and people think that that's what they should do mm. or because they feel they want to be on camera i don't know okay. but you have to think about this is this useful what am i saying when i'm putting myself in there you know every little bit send you know you have every little bit way you know you have to weigh everything every action that you do uh, there has to be a reason for it if there's no reason for it it's just it takes up space for nothing cuz i was thinking sometimes maybe to show the the connection the like emotional connection if i'm going to ask a question and that person's opening up and they're tearing up then i'm tearing up and so if we see that you know there's two people tearing up then we have like this uh this hug or something i feel like it conveys something else too so well I that's that's okay if if you're part of the movie if you're a character in the movie but if you're just doing that to say to people to signal to the audience it's your cue audience to tear up oh. then you're doing it no, no, they should be tearing, they should be tearing up by themselves okay. is is you that is it's 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 artificial you're you're sort of wrenching you're twisting their arm to say cry now while it should come naturally you know we're talking you know you're talking directly to the audience mm -hmm. um unless you are a character in the movie and yeah. you are instrumental your your physical presence is instrumental in telling the story you shouldn't be there mm, okay i think yeah thank you i have a question uh for like when when like my teacher when i was uh studying for documentaries uh they always told us that whenever we have to interview people one of the teachers was oh uh, it depends like it depends whether you go with the camera first like a week before the actual movie and then you just make the the subjects comfortable so like you bring the camera and you tell them this is the camera this is what i'm going to do like explain the process and then actually um it you're not taking an actual video but it's just to make them comfortable in front of the camera and other teachers would be like oh no but like just go there and just have your camera ready 
the reaction of the person if it's if the person is uncomfortable that is something that could be added to the to the documentary and can add a little bit of it so i, I don't know like what what should us like as filmmakers choose like should we tell them already like tell the subject that we are uh, shooting and like make them comfortable because i think when the subject is comfortable it can it, the they can speak a lot more freely or should we like get there and just like point the camera at them and go like yeah go ahead uh tell your story it's okay if it doesn't work we can do it again or something like that like what is the best way to go about this well there's no one you know one perfect answer i mean it's not it depends on the context right it depends on the story you're trying to tell generally though generally in documentary you go for the first you know, you try, you make sure people are on board and are comfortable and the whole build, the whole idea of building a rapport and trust is really, really important in documentary. Now, it, it, when you're doing more TV news stuff, uh, you know, I worked at the Fifth Estate and we were called the gotcha gang and we would, we would, we would, we would arrive in front of a politician's doorstep and say, what do you think about that? <laughs> Because we wanted to catch him in the in the in the act to of, them. of having having to answer a question because otherwise he'd avoid us. So that's something else. But that's that's TV news, you know, or current affairs. Um, you can decide um, because people think, though, even in documentary TV aside, that because people get very self conscious and they're going to start, you know, priming and propping and that. Uh, that maybe you want to, you know, very often you'll notice that if you're shooting a documentary and, and, and you've been talking to people and interviewing them and you turn off the camera and you keep talking, what, they'll, what the person will start saying after the camera is the best stuff because they're finally relaxed and they've forgotten the camera. So there, there are times when maybe you don't want to show them the trappings so that they don't get all, of, you know, they don't start thinking about this. But that's, it depends of who you're dealing with, what the story is, it depends on a lot of things. Um, but generally uh, going, I don't know about bringing the camera and everything, but generally going and getting to know people and, and, and building a rapport and getting them to relax with you is really important in documentary, I would say. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Okay, um, well,